Welcome to the Alien Invasion number 211, recorded on Thursday, February 23rd, 2017. I'm Dave Nelson, along with Brad Ludwig and Anessa Moyens. Coming up on this episode, was Travis Walton rescued by aliens? Did they put a UFO in the latest Walking Dead episode? And there's a new board game based on John Carpenter's The Thing. Plus, the sightings and our picks and warnings. Before all that, though, our question of the week. If you had an, okay, if you had a UFO or extraterrestrial sighting or close encounter, would you let your friends, family, or coworkers in on it? Would you tell them the details? Or would you be too scared that they would uh, ridicule you for... <laughs> I talk about this every week. I would totally tell people. That's true. I didn't think about that before I came up with the question. And they know that I do an alien related podcast. So that would not be out of the normal for me. Okay, quick. Let's She's let's think of a different question here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mike asks, if you were going to open a supermarket on Mars, HB would be my first choice. Oh, that's not a question. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I saw the if you, and I'm like, ooh. But no, I would totally open an HEB on Mars if there was a market for it. Okay. Let me think of the question. Okay. Um, Brad, Vanessa, come up with a question. Quick. Well, I'm curious. Oh, okay. Go, oh. No, go ahead. Go ahead. If you did see a UFO... And you did record it. Would you use anything to help steady your camera? Oh, or would you just do like the shaky hand thing? Because, you know, you're like, oh, my God, UFO. This goes back to a story that we had a long, long time ago where you brought an article with tips on how to properly document a UFO sighting, right? Right. Right. Yep, okay. We did a list of tips to help people that happen to witness a unidentified flying object, um, how to get the best possible shot. Because if you do a, a search on the YouTubes, you're going to find tons of shaky footage. And one of the suggestions was to use your vehicle if you had one nearby as a way to help steady your, your camera or your camera phone so do you guys think that you would be of sign sound mind to actually think of these things do you think you'd you would stay calm enough to rationally figure out that what's the bre the best um proper way of holding the camera and making sure that it didn't get all shaky yes i believe so even if it was like like lights are shining down. There's noise, possible radiation in the air from like that one up, uh, story we had last week, the sighting that we had last week. Oh, yeah. So utter chaos is going on. Do you think that you'd be able to have uh, the sense enough to just think to yourself, okay, this is my one and only shot possibly to get a picture of a UFO. What's the best method of going about this? Yes, I would be able to think about the best method available to me at that time to record the UFO. And I say this because years back, there was snow in Texas. I know, hard to believe. <clears throat> and I was driving from North Texas down to Southwest Texas. And I hit a slick patch, not going very fast, but I ended up into the oncoming traffic. With a big 19 or like a 18 wheeler coming over the the hill. He was still a ways off, but you know, he's getting closer because we're both heading towards each other. Mm -hmm. And I was able to keep my cool and remember what not to do and managed to get myself back into the proper lane <laughs> where I was supposed to be. And then I hit another slip slick patch and slid off the road. But I kept my cool and even had the thought of, huh. So this is how I'm going to die. <laughs> As all of this was going down, that was my first thought. I was like, huh, so, so this is how it ends. Okay, now what not to do? 
Don't jerk the wheel. Check. <laughs> don't so, die. Check. Yes, don't die. Check. So I'm like, okay, gently turn the wheel in the direction I want to go. <laughs> and then I gained so, traction and ended up in the proper lane. Let's circle back around because Brad, did you have something that you wanted? Did you have a question that you had in mind? Nope. This is good. This is better oh. than what I had. Okay. All right. All right. So I think that's good. Uh, we we worked through that and good job. <laughs> what am I trying to say? So let's wrap it up here. Let's let's. So I okay. So my answer is, I don't think I'd be able to handle everything because puppy class. Okay, my puppy barks a lot, freaks out because the other dogs are there, not because he's angry at the dogs or wants to um, bite them. He's excited to see them. So he's barking during the entire class, and I can't concentrate on the things that we're working on in class because he's barking. So I don't think I could handle a UFO sighting and being of sound, sound mind to have the best proper way of holding my camera to get a good shot. I'm just, I'm being honest. I don't think I can handle it. All right. I, I will say that like on our comments, the listeners, Joanna would not try to record it. She would, she wants to experience it as is okay. without any interference from a screen. Um, Mike doesn't feel that he'd be able to get good footage because he met George Takei in an elevator and couldn't keep his hand steady enough to take a picture because he was like, <laughs> I, I assume he was fanboying. So, <laughs> very nice. Yeah. All, All right. right. Let's wrap it up there. Perfect. Thank you guys. Um, by the way, Joanne, I would love to hear your UFO encounter sometime. So, why don't you, um, if you want, email uh, aliens at gncasts.com. If you want to share, if you don't want to share, that's fine. I think it would be, it would make for great, uh, a great sighting on a future episode. So. Oh yeah, totally. I would love to hear about your encounters. All right, let's get on with the news. So we're recording again. And I believe the first story goes to Anessa. So just launch right in Anessa. I love the title of the story. Aliens accidentally killed me, but took my corpse onto UFO to save my life. There's a lot going on there. So a man was accidentally killed by a laser blast from a UFO before his corpse was taken aboard and he was miraculously brought to life. It has astonishingly been claimed. The events which allegedly happened to Travis Walton 41 years ago are one of the world's most infamous so-called alien abduction cases. But now it appears he may not actually have been abducted after all, but instead rescued. The twist in the story has been revealed by UFO researcher J.P. Robinson after meeting with Mr. Walton at an alien conference. The... <clears throat> Excuse me. The case began in November 1975 in the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest near Phoenix, Arizona, when six forestry workers of Mr. Walton's reported him missing after they allegedly saw him get blasted 20 feet by an energy beam from a UFO that appeared over the trees. Officers thought it was an elaborate cover-up, and they actually had killed him and disposed of the body. But five days later, he turned up saying he had been abducted by aliens and had been forced to punch his way out. He relayed what happened in his book, Fire in the Sky. Might sound familiar because there is a movie um, that came out in 1983. He claims to have seen three gray aliens on the UFO and later human looking beings described as smooth skinned and blemishless. Now, Mr. Robinson has relayed the new details on his website. He wrote, I was never convinced of the authenticity of this incident. Not to say I don't believe it, just that you can never be wholly sure. All that changed when I met Travis Walton. 
and got the fantastic opportunity to speak face to face with the man who claims to have met beings from another world and try to figure out whether he is for real or just a really good liar. After having spent quality time in his presence and talking privately about his experience, I can only conclude that this man did meet these beings aboard that ship. What wasn't clear before was the question of why would they zap him with that beam of light to begin with? It's all a bit too sci-fi for me. However, he said he now realizes it was an accident which killed Mr. Walton. He said Travis was in the wrong place at the wrong time and should have never stood so close to such an incredible machine. He himself explained that he was just about to turn back to the truck seconds before being struck. Now it seems that as the craft was preparing to take off into the night, it inadvertently knocked Travis for six, killing him in the process. Knocked Travis for six. Okay. Yes, you read that right. Travis told me that he believed that he was actually dead. So now we get to the real question, which so many people ask. Why did they take him on board? Well, according to the man himself, they took him in order to save his life, and they clearly succeeded in doing so. Mr. Robinson said the story now has a more legitimate tone. He added that it was an accident and act of humanitarianism. He said, Travis Walton has made me believe again, or should I say, know again, that we are truly in the midst of something remarkable, and it is only a matter of time before the bigger picture is revealed. Now, 41 years on, Mr. Walton and his former co-workers still maintain their account of what is recognized as the world's most remarkable UFO sighting and alien abduction claim on record. The team, who were on a tree thinning project, have all passed lie detector tests over the remarkable incident in November 1975, adding credibility to their account. The seven of them reported how they were driving in the forest in a truck when they first saw the mysterious lights, which then appeared to be a flying saucer up in the canopy. A mesmerized Mr. Walton was the only one among them to venture out of the vehicle and approach the craft, despite his colleagues pleading with him not to go near. Mr. Walton said, my eyes were just riveted on this thing. Then it threw me back through the air 20 feet. His colleagues reported seeing him fly backwards with his back arched from a beam of light bearing down from the craft. The terrified men fled in the vehicle, but returned later when there was no trace of the UFO or Mr. Walton. Mr. Walton insists he woke up inside the alien craft, lying on a table and surrounded by three alien beings with other humanoid-looking uh, beings in the background. He said, I got this rush of adrenaline and jumped from the table and just lashed out. Then I blacked out and woke up on the side of the road and ran to the nearest call box and collapsed. What he didn't know at the time was that he had been gone for five days. There are still skeptics, however, and those who claim it was an elaborate hoax. The OccupyTheory.org website, part of the Occupy movement, is not convinced by the story and points out that there were no witnesses to Mr. Walton being drawn up into the craft, adding that he would have hid for five days before reappearing. In a report about the case, the website said, once Walton returned, he just he wouldn't just talk to the press. He'd only talk with the publications that believed in UFOs. The story ran in the National Enquirer in 1975. It also claimed he failed a lie detector carried out by the Enquirer, and there was a history of UFO slash alien claims among his immediate family before the abduction. And that comes from the express.co.uk. I just keep on thinking the aliens inside the craft, they're like, oh, crap. I think we just killed. <laughs> we were only supposed to collect samples, guys, not kill the humans. They, they bring them on board. Like, sorry, dude, our bad. Totally. Don't we'll tell mom. Them. Don't tell mom. Don't tell mom. <laughs> That's, this is an interesting theory. I never, I've never heard this. A new twist, a new wrinkle in the tail. Indeed. Do you guys believe him? Do you guys believe that uh, he was taken by aliens? Of what you have read or what you have watched in the movie, do you, do you believe it? Well, kind of. I, I'm I'm inclined to believe at least 
part of it, like where something did happen because you have other witnesses there, um, other coworkers of his that were there that witnessed this bright flash. Um, but then they took off. It sounds like they didn't hang around and be like, oh, where's Walton? Don't know. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in the options of fight or flight, they chose flight. So yeah, that goes back to our question. Would you uh, would you stay calm during a situation like that? Calm enough to help your friend, or calm enough to uh, take a picture? I, I would. I believe. I would like to think that I would, but you know, <laughs> a bright flash of light—you never know. Um, I, I do believe what they're they're saying. Yeah, it's it's nineteen seventy five. Um. But his his friends are, you know, they're telling the truth about what they saw. And so I, I at least believe the story up to that extent, because that's how much of the story that they experienced. So, um, yeah, I don't know if maybe it knocked him out and he had these really crazy dreams. You know how you incorporate, like environmental noises and whatnot into your dreams. Like, I wonder if he was having like one of those dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he was just, uh, maybe he was just injured out there for, you know, three days or how many days was it? Five days, five days, five days. And, you know, he made up the story to make it better than the actual story that he just was left behind. You know, who knows? Right. Who knows? We weren't there. It's very true. I have an open mind. I'm going to say, yes, it was totally true. So, all right. Thank you very much, Anessa. That was an awesome story. Something new to think about. Yep. All right. All right. All right. All right. That's my uh, very white Matthew McConaughey impersonation. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, he is white. He is white. Yeah. Well, maybe my very nerdy McConaughey impersonation. <laughs> there you go. I'm like, he's actually from Uvalde, which is 75 miles from where I grew up. Uvalde. All right, let's wrap. All right. So, yo, uh, yiggity, yo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. since the last time we spoke, what has been going on in your worlds, Anessa and Brad? Hmm. Well, I get a snow day tomorrow. Yay. So, woohoo, no work. Brad gets to take the kitties into the vet for their shots. Yes. And I'm going to hang out at home with Alex because Alex is not a fan of dogs. And, you know, there's usually dogs at the vet. Yep. And then tomorrow I leave for Man's Woodworking Weekend. Dun dun dun! The Where annual event. Where is it? Uh, it uh, we descend upon uh, a friend. You remember Rob Benton? Yes, he's a, a good friend of mine and a former guest on a guest on Adventure Party. Uh, his uh, his parents snowbird uh, in Texas and in Mexico and. Uh, his dad has a quite the collection of woodworking tools, um, bandsaw. Uh, he's got a huge lathe, which is absolutely amazing. And once a year, usually sometime in February, we head down to Broadhead, Wisconsin, and we do a bit of woodworking over the weekend. Like, what was the project last year that you worked on? What did you make? Uh, was that the year that I made the, your oh. stone egg holder? I can't remember. That was the year. That was the year before. Before. Because the year before that was the rolling pin. Yeah. And then. I'm going to say tie holder. Sure. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, sure. Uh, I'm actually, I think last year, maybe I didn't have a project. Oh, that's right. Because you were going to make the handles, the tap handles. Yeah, I was going to make the tap that handle. that didn't go as planned. Yeah. So, so I was using it. I was lathing a piece of wood. And it's, 
uh, I, I had a pretty good shape going for a beer tap handle and the hunk of wood just kind of, and it, it, it broke. Uh, I wasn't hurt and it didn't come off the lathe, but it just totally, it, it, it disintegrated in, in one part uh, of the tap handle. So it was unusable. So that was that. So better luck this year, my friend. Yep. This year I am working on a cigar box guitar, an electric cigar box guitar for that matter. Awesome. Yep. I can't wait uh, to see the finished product. Uh, me too. Uh, you play guitar? <laughs> I do not. Uh, well, I took lessons eons ago and now I've kind of, this is something I, I really, it's on my bucket list of things to build. And once I have it built, then I need to uh, learn how to use it. So, uh, just, uh, adding to my collection of things that I wish to do before I am no longer on this planet. All right. Fill in the bucket list is what I'm doing. My friend, fill in the bucket. Do you, list. Have, a do you have a deadline? Or are you on a, a no, a no, I'm not on a deadline. It just, you know, no time like the present. You don't know how long you have on this planet. So do it now while you can. Well, uh, this week I ended 12 days in a row of working. So it was nice to get a little little time off, although I've had to go into work the last two days. What? Just for meetings and things like that. Our, mm. our regular staff meeting was yesterday. Then I met with our program director for our monthly air check. And then today we had a meeting about our big, our big ratings promotion. Um, Ooh. Our ratings period starts next week. I believe it's earlier than the states i don't think uh in the states spring book doesn't start until march right I uh i'm a little sketchy on that now i i don't get to be as close to it anymore uh, as i used to doing what i do now so march all right let's move on with the news all right hang on this is a fun story I've wanted to somehow incorporate zombies into this podcast since the very beginning when we started. And my dream is coming true on this episode. Was Damn. there was there a UFO in the Walking Dead episode on Sunday? Possibly. Did you guys watch it? Are you guys still watching The Walking Dead? I'm on whatever last season was, season six. Okay. Yep. Well, we hopefully. are... We are behind. Okay, hopefully, I don't think this will spoil too much. So, did you read? Did you read what I have here? No. Okay. I saw The Walking Dead and then I stopped. All right. I'll try to sort of censor it a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so I can take my headphones off, and then Brad can give uh, me the thumbs up. No, it's okay. It's oh. okay. Um. So it was a sort of a weird episode. There was some strange su stuff happening in the latest episode of um, The Walking Dead. And one of the shots, a person caught what they believe could be a UFO in the background of a certain scene. And what? what's, weird, what's weird is pretty sure the scene would be CG. But it doesn't look like it. Um so first instinct uh, first instinct is maybe a plane accidentally got caught in the background shot. Um, remember that this scene was made using green screen, so it seems a little strange to miss this detail, though it does seem like the most likely scenario. This is the article that's saying all this. However, there is one other explanation besides birds and editing errors. So, oh, okay. So what happened was a few objects flew in the sky in the background. Um, while the things at the tree line are quite, quite ob obviously birds, there's one object above them that's traveling at a much faster speed than most of the birds there. Huh. So, um, however, there is, okay, let me go back to what I was saying. 
However, there's one other explanation besides birds and editing errors. UFOs. It might sound a little far-fetched, but now this is this is where it gets interesting. Considering the fact that we're watching a show taking place in a world where zombies exist, aliens at least have to be suggested. Not to mention that when The Walking Dead creator Robert Kirkman originally pitched the comics, he mentioned there would be alien involvement. Kirkman told The Hollywood Reporter back in 2013, when I pitched uh, The Walking Dead originally, it was turned down simply because uh, there had uh, not been a successful zombie book in the history of comics. I wasn't willing to accept no for an answer, and so I said, well, oh, no, he said, oh, well, I forgot to tell you that this is actually a big setup for an alien invasion. Um, apparently, Kirkman pitched that in the comics, the zombies had been created by an alien race, as a way for human beings to be wiped out before the aliens took over Earth. However, after three issues of the comic, or after three issues of the comic had been released, Kirkman then revealed there would be no aliens, admitting he'd uh, tricked his publisher into accepting his comic, his uh, zombie comic. Though interestingly, there was a short spin-off Walking Dead comic released last year called The Walking Dead: The Alien which told the story of Rick's brother, Jeff Grimes. Hmm. Hmm. So I'm thinking that maybe this was like an Easter egg. Like, like Kirkman was involved in this little gag in some way. And they're like, remember that whole thing about the aliens? You should put that in there just to see if somebody notices it. <laughs> Crazy. And you can see the video in the link that I will put in the show notes. And you guys can see for yourself. And Anessa and Brad, I encourage you to watch this. You will not be spoiled by anything if you watch this video. It's just a loop of the scene over and over again. It's just Rick and you see in the background what looks like birds and then possibly a UFO. <laughs> All right. You guys want to take a look at that now? I would love, I'd, I would love your opinion. You want to click on the link real quick? I am clicking it now. I wish there was a way I could throw a link in um, our video, but there's not, unfortunately. Oh, you guys, did you hear about last, not this last week, but the week before last Walking Dead episode? No. There was a major zombie kill. Like, they set the record for most number of, of, of walkers killed in one in one shot. Nice. Yeah, I it almost looks like a wait. Hang on. I'm thinking airplane. Boy, it's hard to say. <laughs> Maybe uh it looks like it flutters for a second. I'm thinking it's a bird. Okay, maybe a bird that got closer than other birds? Well, it's going in and out of the clouds, though. Is it? Because if you notice, it fades. <laughs> so if you guys are interested, the ones that are watching or listening to this podcast, mm -hmm. uh, definitely check it out in the show notes and uh, mm -hmm. let us know what you think. Do you think it's an, a UFO or just uh, the bird thing? Airplane or airplanes. I don't think that they have airplanes in the walking dead. No, they don't. <laughs> they do in Georgia. And it's green screen too, right? So why would they make that big of a, a mistake? Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I could just, is Kirkman still a part of the show or did he? No, yeah, he's definitely, part of it. yeah, he's definitely a part of the show. Oh, maybe that's his way of just nodding to his initial pitch. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's wrap that up here. That story is done. We're done talking about that. Move on. All right, Brad, you're up. So uh, what you got there, Mr. Brad? Well... 
since I do the show called the Adventure Party and we talk about games and gaming, this almost seems to be too good of an opportunity to pass up. Okay. Um, for those that aren't familiar with Adventure Party, can you just do a brief synopsis of what that's all about and then jump into the news story? Uh, myself and my co-host, Glenn Bittner, who is a uh, he, he's a manager of a game shop in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and he plays a lot of different games. So this podcast includes Glenn's game reviews for uh, games that he has run and plays. He has an immense game library. And we just talk about board games, card games, role-playing games, all sorts of different kinds of games. So uh, Don't forget reindeer gra- games. Uh, there can be reindeer games at times, usually in the winter. Uh, we're kind of coming out of that season, so far less reindeer games now. But this combines aliens and board games. But Ooh. this com- this combines a very famous alien-based movie. And here, the, the title of this uh, particular article is Zip Up Your Mittens for Mondo's new board game of john carpenter's the thing john carpenter's the thing adapted from john w campbell's immortal 1938 novella who goes there is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year oh god i feel old i saw a picture of andrew ridgely from wham and uh he looks like somebody's grandfather so i feel i felt really old today well a new hope is 40 this year yeah i know Ugh. Uh, anyways, enough of that pity fest. Uh, now there's an elaborate board game from Mondo and the U.S. Opoly subsidiary Project Raygun. With infection at Outpost 31, which is the name of the game, players bundle up in polar fleece while trying to discover who among them is infected with a shape-shifting alien virus. Toasty jackets aren't mandatory, but it certainly could add to the overall atmosphere while you listen to the eerie The Thing score and take your turn gathering clues and attempting to ferret out the infected. Here's how Mondo's Jay Shaw explained the creative process. When we set out to create the first licensed Mondo board game, the biggest question was what film property would we go after? So many of the films we celebrate at Mondo would be an absolute blast in game form. As soon as John Carpenter's uh, a suspense masterpiece, The Thing was mentioned, it was very quickly, uh, it very quickly became our top choice. The next step was to figure out how to actually make a game. We all love playing them, but none of us had designed one before. Game mechanics are an incredibly complicated art form, and we didn't want to enter this space unless we were going to get it right. Luckily, our dear friends at Project Raygun were completely up to the challenge. They've built an incredibly challenging, fast-paced game of paranoia that transports players directly into the film. And this story comes to us from Blaster.com. You think uh, that you and Glenn would want to play this game and do a review for uh, adventure party. I would definitely do that. I, it's one of my favorite sci-fi horror films it, uh, right up to, I'd say the thing and alien are in my top two spots. Well, they're very similar because you don't really know the aliens there until the very end. Like you don't really see the alien until pretty much the end. Uh, they both take place in the 70s, and they both have crazy music. They do. And, you know, the main difference between The Thing and Alien is that we get glimpses of the creature from time to time. But it is, it is in, it's fluid in its shape, and it, uh, it's so crazy. And the the practical effects that they had in it uh, today today are still spoken of and whispered awe <laughs> with uh, even with today's practical effects. Um, I, yeah, it's it it still holds up. 
that's what makes the movie so scary is you don't know what the alien's going to be. No. Anything or anybody. Yeah. And and the ending for the thing is just it's maddening because you you want to know. You want to know and you're in the cusp of knowing and then it fades to black. Uh so uh yeah, it just it's great and it would be cool to play a game that can actually kind of harness that same sense of dread, fear and and paranoia. Um I would I would totally be on board for it. When does this come out? Is it out already? It's not out already. Uh, they don't have a date for it, and they don't have cover art for it yet. So uh, the only thing that they could do is really make the announcement that they've started the process and uh, that it will happen. But that's that's all the information that we have right now. Well, when it comes out, you should definitely get it. Definitely play it for both Adventure Party and as a pick for Alien Invasion. That would be super cool. Yeah, what's nice is Glenn, uh, a lot of game companies are kind of getting preview copies out to game, like brick and mortar game stores. So Glenn has managed to get preview copies for a number of different games. So I'm kind of hoping that uh, Mondo and uh, Project Raygun uh, will, will will do that and uh, offer this as, a, as kind of a pre-release so he can take a look at it. What does he get it, and then maybe he sends you a copy? Is that how that works? No, what he does is he he'll get a copy and he'll play it in Milwaukee and tell me about it. But if he actually gets a hold of this game, we'll be making a road trip to Milwaukee so we can play it be before fun. we do a show. So, yeah, I would totally make a trip to to Milwaukee to play this. All right, something to look forward to. Yes, absolutely. All right. That's good to go right there. All right. So, Anessa, are you ready with the sighting? I am. I actually found an article that had two sightings, but I'm only going to talk about the one. I know. I know. Otherwise, we'd be here all night or all day whenever people are listening. So what is it? Well, um, a couple enjoy a couple enjoying an evening stroll along Portreath Beach were left mesmerized and had to flee. Um, after what spotting, <laughs> they had to flee after seeing a UFO. So that's what they would do: fight or flight. They're flying away. Um, it is a second reported UFO sighting in just a few weeks, as two women claim to have been left shocked and in awe of a huge UFO they saw in Penzance. Speaking to UK UFOs about the sighting in Portreath, a woman who gave only her last name, Miss Cousins, said that she was walking along the beach with her partner when events started to take an eerie turn. Miss Cousins said that she and her partner were watching the ocean, but soon noticed that they could not hear it. She said that as she was walking along the beach with her partner, as it was peaceful, she continued, we sat down on the bench by the cafe. As soon as we looked at the ocean, we noticed everything went silent. It was an eerie feeling. We feel like we were in a different time zone. The couple reportedly looked up and realized that hovering over their heads was a huge UFO. Miss Cousin said, We looked up and we saw this black-shaped boomerang object that looked so big that we sat frozen just staring at this thing. We were both so mesmerized by this. All of a sudden, we heard a humming sound, and we looked at each other, and then all of a sudden, it disappeared. According to UK UFOs, the sighting took place at Portreath Beach on Monday, February 20th. The sighting adds to a theory that Cornwall could be a UFO triangle of paranormal activity. Know where I'm going on my next trip to the UK. After seeing the strange UFO, the startled couple left the beach, heading home to lock their doors and contemplate what it was that they saw in the skies above Portreath. And me and my partner ran from the beach, ran home and locked our doors, added Miss Cousins. Whatever it was, was so big, it covered the stars. According to David Gillum, founder of Cornwall UFO Research Group, 
No sightings were reported to them. However, he is currently trying to get more information on a sighting in Penzance that left two women haunted and in awe of a strange phenomenon spotted in the skies. David said, we haven't had anything reported to us as yet in the Portrait area. The last sighting we had in Cornwall was in Penzance, but it was a few weeks ago now. David is now appealing to members of the public who may be able to give him more information on the reported sighting over Penzance that left two women fearing there would be a plane crash. And this comes from CornwallLive.com. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a funny joke to incorporate Penzance. I mean, the obvious is pirates. Pirates of Penzance? Arr. No? Nothing? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, not not totally up on the uh, Gilbert and Sullivan collection. Oh, come on, Brad. Get with the program. Sorry. So, I think what they got there is a triangle. A black triangle UFO. That's what it sounds like to me. What do you guys yep. think? Yep. I think so. I could see that. And those things are known to be very silent, very quiet. They and deadly. Not what? And Nothing. deadly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, no, this is. I've heard other reports about how they just kind of appear out of nowhere, and people like they're looking up and they're like, "Where'd the stars go?" Oh, there's a big black giant, gi- gigantic triangle floating above me making no noise whatsoever so it's that sounds like what this is bum, bum, bum. <laughs> it does that's what it sounds like so i i don't know how into ufos this particular couple is but if they're not and this is what they saw it seems legit i like the part where you talk about how something about Hang on one second. Let me find the the line. Uh, Oh, we noticed everything went silent. It was eerie. It was an eerie feeling. We felt like we were in a different time zone. That's kind of a cool way of putting it. Like it it kind of blocked out everything, not just the stars, but sound and everything else. Yeah, it's kind of wild that it would silence everything, especially the ocean. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, that's pretty loud and noisy, even on its quiet days. You hear it. Well, maybe they got within, like, the, the UFO's, like, tractor beam or whatever, or, like, force field. You know, maybe these crafts have some kind of force field uh, protecting it. Or, you know, we've talked about how maybe a lot of UFOs are not just, they don't not just travel through space, but travel through time and dimensions. Maybe they're within it, like their own warp bubble or something like that. Maybe. It could be. Maybe that whole missing time thing. Maybe that's part of that. Maybe they were abducted and don't realize it. Oh, yes. They better go get uh, hypnot- hypnotized <laughs> soon. This happened on my birthday, by the way. Monday. What? Yeah. Nice. Happy belated birthday. Thank you very much. You guys, uh, I, I'm actually, I have two of my gifts in the video shot for those of you watching us on YouTube or Facebook. I'm wearing my brand new headphones, which were a gift from my lovely wife, Stephanie. They're Sennheisers, very top of the line Sennheisers. And then I got an on-air light sign behind me. I've always wanted one of those. Sweet. <laughs> got it all now. Got it <laughs> me. I can die. <laughs> so what do you think, Brad? What do you think of this this sighting? Well, I um, I don't know what to make of it. We've got a You know, I sometimes I wonder if you have an experience with another person that's very I don't want to say necessarily traumatic. Well, this was, you know, there was a lot going on here. Um, but, you know, where something is really 
something really strange is happening if the two of you don't maybe heighten the experience just with your reactions to what's going on and do, do you know what I'm saying? That maybe exactly what you're you, you, you make it more into something than what it actually was. And I'm not yeah. saying that they're lying or anything. I'm just saying that you can really heighten the experience of, of something that happens. Um, yeah. Like two people come back to the house. Okay. You're sitting there watching TV or whatever. And two people come back to the house and they're all excited about this experience they had. It could be anything, but yep. more exciting because it happened to both of them and nobody else. Like it to you would be like, uh, whatever. But to them, it's like, oh my God, this is the most awesome thing ever that just happened. Yeah. I, and you know, I was, eyewitness accounts aren't always as reliable as stuff that is actually recorded and documented uh, through other means. So uh, it's hard to say. I, I want to believe um, but yeah, God, it would been would have been great if somebody could have gotten some some video or pictures on this as well. Going back to our question of the week, yeah, or maybe they didn't have their phones with them. Well, and that could be it too, or maybe they weren't working. Batteries dead. Some kind of because electromagnetic the, interference, the or yeah, the zone that they're in, the the space time continuum warp bubble dimensional thing, <laughs> whatever. You just don't know. All right, all right, all right. Uh, I think that's <laughs> it. Good. Time for picks and warnings. Oh, I need to answer the question in uh, the chat. So, how many separate streams is Be Life capable of? Um, yeah, we're in different places, and actually, it only handles two sources because Brad. They're in the same room. He's using ManyCam to uh, split their, their two videos up. So really, it's just two. Yeah. So, hope that helped. No, I, lo I love Be Live. I wish they would expand, though, a little bit. And um... <laughs> Sorry, those are my fingers showing that I was... <laughs> I'm here. They, they, you know, if they added at least one more, they'd, they'd be on to something. They could uh, definitely compete with uh, the likes of YouTube Live or other, uh, other ones. Yep. All right. Let's do this thing. Let's uh, do our picks and warnings. All right. Picks and warnings time. These are things that we enjoyed or not. Related to UFOs and extraterrestrials. And it looks like Brad is first on the docket. I am. I watched a movie on the Netflix. Um, broke it up between a couple of lunch breaks. And that movie... <laughs> uh, I remember seeing it when it came out in the theater and thinking... I really wanted to to like it, and it was interesting. That movie was Lost in Space from 1998, and in it we had uh, Heather Graham, we had I think Lacey Chabert was in it, uh, Mimi Rogers, the former uh, Mrs. Cruz. <laughs> I think she was the first. Uh, let's see, we got Joey. Uh, yep, Gary Oldman, Matt LeBlanc. Whoa. I, yeah, I know, right? And let's see. Yeah, those are the big ones. Well, uh, June Lockhart and the guy that played the original Don West. Um, he was in it. Uh, oh, and Jared Harris, the guy who plays a lot of creepy dudes <laughs> uh he was in it and he played well i won't give it away if you haven't seen it it's a good time to get caught up on this though because netflix is uh coming out with their lost in space series yeah very true so the core premise of this is that uh dr robinson uh played by i just said his name william hurt 
uh, is working on a project called the Jupiter Project. And they are going to send his fa- he and his family out into space. And in 10 years time, they're supposed to reach a planet called Beta Prime. And they are going to build a, a hyperspace gate that would, they, they're finishing up one on Earth. And by the time they get to Alpha Prime, or I'm sorry, Beta Prime, and they can construct theirs, they would have a, a gate, an anchored gate in which you could just travel from Earth to Beta Prime. Boom, you're there. They've established that in this world, the rules for hyperspace travel is you need a gateway. Otherwise you will end up somewhere random if you just fire up the hyperdrive. So you need to have it controlled through these gates. Now, unbeknownst to the rest of the human population, the earth has 20 years left to really be able to support human life. Well, so the, the hope is they get to beta prime link this up and everybody can evacuate the earth. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the ozone layer is, uh, down 40% and it's continuing to drop. Um, they're having climate issues, uh, resources are being tapped out and, uh, things are kind of going to hell in a handbasket. Now there are a group of people who wish to profit from this as, often there are. And one of the people who are a part of this is Gary Oldman's character, Dr. Smith. And uh, wackiness ensues. Dr. Smith is betrayed and he is knocked unconscious and left on the Jupiter uh, uh, Jupiter craft. And so he is stuck with the Robinsons and Major West, the pilot. And uh, they have wacky adventures. Now, the interesting thing about this is it's established early on that Will Robinson has been working with time travel. He's got, he's got an experiment, and of course he took first place in the science fair as he does every year, but he's actually kind of got some fundamentals of time travel, but nobody believes that he has done this. As they travel out into space, I'm not going to give away some of the stuff that happens, but as they travel in space, they find this kind of window, um, kind of a weird anomaly, and they pass through it. And this is one of the plot holes that I found in the film. The, the thing that they travel through is a time gateway in which they move about 20 years into the future. And... This is one of the core events that really kind of guides what what happens throughout the rest of the film. So I, I don't want to give that part away. But the thing that that made me kind of stop and go, what? If they move forward in time 20 years, okay, they run into a ship, another ship from Earth. They haven't built the gateway. So everybody on Earth should be in really horrible shape. <laughs> Um, we don't know if they've like, I think they can't manufacture tons of these ships because their resources are being depleted on the earth. So there's just like a big plot hole that I, I didn't really enjoy watching it recently the second time. So anyway, they did a fine job of paying homage to, uh, early, uh, like the TV show of lost in space. Like I said, jo- uh, June Lockhart shows up. And uh, the original actor who played Don West, Major Don West, the the pilot of of the Jupiter 2. The ship that they travel in, the first ship that you see is the Jupiter craft. And it looks like the flying saucer that they flew in in the 50s program. But it's actually in the movie, it's like the first stage. It's the Jupiter 1 and when they get to a certain point in uh, escaping the Earth's gravity, they blow out this outer shell and you get to see the Jupiter 2, which is a very streamlined and sort of an ergonomic looking ship as opposed to the classic UFO ship that they uh, had, like I said, used in the 50s program. So uh, one other thing that I kind of noticed is um, 
as I recall, the I remember being totally wowed by what they did when uh, the effect that they did when they first jump into hyperspace. Like all of time seems to stop and stuff is sort of falling, but it's everything is frozen in time on the ship. And now I look at, you know, when you got to like 1999, when they did the same thing in the matrix, the effects that they used there were light years ahead of this. And it's only one year difference between the two films uh, in their release, at least. So uh, it was interesting to see that Matrix had done it better, even though that there was that short period of time between the two of them. So uh, other than that, it's an okay film. It's interesting. It's a good popcorn movie if you want to watch it. Uh, I would give it... I would give it two and a half, maybe three. When it came out, I don't think I've seen it. Maybe I've seen it once since then, but it's been a while. So maybe if I went to, if I went back to watch it, I'd think it is a lot worse than it was when I first saw it. Possibly. I don't know. Possibly. Yeah. Looking forward to the new series. It looks pretty good. It should be interesting. Some awesome stuff coming on Netflix. We got, uh, we got that. You got uh, Mystery Science Theater three thousand. Yes, April. in April, mm-hmm. April fourteenth. Mm-hmm. Sweet. All right. Oh, uh, it's exciting. I watched something today that was very unexpected. I didn't know this was coming, and I saw it online. And I had to. I saw it a couple of times before I realized what it was. It's the prologue to Alien Covenant. For for some reason, I have Aliens Covenant. That's incorrect. It's Alien Covenant. It's called Last Supper. Uh, It's the official prologue to Alien Covenant, which introduces the crew of the mission as they gather for their final meal before entering cryosleep. Um. Set aboard, set aboard the Covenant, a colony. I'm getting feedback from something. That's me. I'm getting antsy. I'm tired of sitting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> set aboard the Covenant, a colonization ship <laughs> on its way to a remote planet f- to form a new human settlement. The main crew, all couples, and their android, Walter, or Izzy, uh, enjoy the final meal together before a cryo sleep. Walt, okay, here's a spoiler. Walter is actually David. Um, what? What's his face? Uh, the actor, help me out. Um, Michael Fassbender's character. Also, I didn't know he was in it, but um, what's his name? Uh, oh, shoot. It's been a lot of stuff. He was in Gattaca. What's his name? Ethan Hawk. Ethan Hawk is the captain of the ship. Bam. Is it Ethan Hawk? Hang on one second. I need to check this before I I don't want to lie to the people. Uh I I pride or, I have pride in the show that we give out correct information all the time. We never get it wrong. So I'm gonna look this up. Oh, uh, let's see. It's got Michael Fassbender, Catherine Waterson, Waterston, sorry, Billy Crudup, Danny McBride, James Franco, James Franco. Yeah, yeah, that's the one that I was thinking. Did I say James Franco? No, Ethan Hawke. No. Ethan Hawke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know why I get those two mixed up. It's weird. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's good. It's um. There's a scene where. One of the characters is choking, and you think it's going to happen. You think the alien's going to burst out of their chest or whatever. But it's then David or whatever his name is, uh, Walter comes up and like um, hits her in the back of the on the back, and uh, she coughs up whatever it is, and he goes, "I got your back." <laughs> <laughs> so this is on YouTube. Um, getting ready for the release of Alien Covenant, which comes out on May 19th, 2017. So I highly recommend it. It's cool to see... um, Hang on one second. I have to think of his... I have to see his name. I can't think of his name. Um, Billy 
no, not Bill. Uh, Danny McBride. It's it's weird to see Danny McBride in Danny McBride in a serious movie like this. Because yeah. you're used to seeing him in comedies, right? Yep, absolutely. So it looks like a pretty decent cast. Looking forward to it. Um, again, that's uh, Alien Covenant, the official prologue. It's called Last Supper, and you can find it in the show notes or just do a Google search. You will uh, find it to watch for free somewhere out there. All right. Oh, uh, Flying Saucers, three and a half out of five. No, oh, okay. There was, I mean, it's not enough. I think if it was longer, I would have given it a better rating, but it was so short that I didn't really get a f- good enough feel for the way the movie's going to be. I kind of, it's very much got the original alien vibe to it, just from this prologue. Now, that may not be the rest of the movie, but with just this short video, it's got that alien vibe to it. So uh, it's got that going for it. Yeah, just looking at what little that I saw, the ambient noise and everything, it just has that same that mm-hmm. same feel to it. So, Yeah, and it's, it's, it's human beings going out to colonize for the first time. So this is, this is way before the events in the other alien. Well, I, I think it's like 20 years before the events of alien. So still early on. All right, Anessa, what do you have as your pick and or warning? Her microphone's off. Yep. <laughs> I was just trying to keep, keep the noise down. Yeah. I'm like I said, kind of tired of sitting. Um, so I have a wonderfully terrible movie called Supersonic Man. <laughs> but I watched this with riff tracks, which makes it way more tolerable. And I was telling Brad a little bit about it, but essentially you've got a superhero named Kronos who comes from a distant galaxy and he ends up going up against a mad scientist over the fate of mankind. So yeah, it's bad (laughs) without any commentary. So if you watch it, I highly recommend either watch it with a group of friends or watch it with the riff tracks, but don't watch it by yourself. Um, you the the movie starts out and you have Kronos flying to Earth and the the superhero he has a cape he's wearing a a, a red suit he has what kind of reminds me of the flash symbol on his chest but around it it's got like a different color border the lightning of course is different the lightning bolt he has a blue mask and a blue cape and they're both very sparkly and as he's flying he flies in the usual superhero that you imagine flying through the air with the arms out in front and then i don't know if he gets tired or he if he gets bored but his arms will kind of go out to his sides like he's pretending to be an airplane for a while and they'll go back in front and then he'll bring like his arm one of his arms in and tuck like kind of like tuck it in and yeah and it's they really could have cut out a lot of dead space in this movie to make it flow a little better and so there is this evil scientist he ends up kidnapping a another scientist and he wants him to work with him to build something that would help him take over mankind (laughs) or get rid of mankind i forget which and so the guy gets kidnapped. The guy, the scientist's daughter, is trying to figure out what happened, what has happened to her dad. And there is this, I, I put in quotes, high speed chase, which there's nothing speedy about this chase. And she's trying to get away in this little Volkswagen Beetle from these two guys one of them happens to have a gun which comes out like after five minutes of them driving around and and she turns onto a dirt road and there is a steamroller which i swear is just like one big wooden prop that chronos picks up she drives underneath it he puts it back down 
the bad guys behind her like swerve to miss the steamroller and go over the side of a quote cliff which ends up being more of a gentle slope and halfway down the slope the car explodes this is the kind of quality movie that you would be getting if you watched it <laughs> it's it's ridiculous if you love cheesy movies i i, I do highly recommend it with riff tracks um I forget where I saw it. Oh, I saw it on Amazon through Amazon Prime. I don't know if it's available on Netflix though. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. Cheesy superhero movie. Oh, spoiler alert. The guy has to say a little chant to switch over to superhero mode, and it looks like he's wearing like a plastic banded watch, like maybe a Timex or something. It was made in 1979, so <laughs> imagine the effects. I I have. Have you seen it? No, I I I've, I've imagined the effects. Oh, okay, you've imagined the effects. Yes. So yeah, with riff tracks, I would give it. I'd give it three flying saucers out of five. But without. Man. Negative one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be nice and give it a one, just out of the occasional cheesiness factor that I enjoy so much. All right. <laughs> wasn't, uh, Brad, wasn't Kronos a DC? Well, Kronos is a DC character, right? But it's yes. not the same character. Not the same person, no. Okay. And the name Kronos ends up in mythology as well. So it's not just comic books. It's been around for hundreds of years. Gotcha. What she said. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. In review, our picks and warnings this week. Were the following Rift Tracks Supersonic Man? We had Alien Covenant Prologue, Last Supper video, and Lost in Space from 1998 on Netflix. And you can find the links to our picks and warnings in the show notes. You can check them out for yourselves. All right, let's close it out here. Close it out. That's going to do it for this edition of the Alien Invasion, a Galactic Network podcast. If you'd like to read more about the stories that we covered on this episode, click the links in the show notes. We'd like to thank Monkey Warhol for providing our intro music. You can find his stuff at soundcloud.com slash Monkey Warhol. Also, uh, Retward von Dernberg, a composer from Germany, for our closing song called Be Water. Learn more about him and his stuff at the caravel.net, T-H-E-C-A-R-A-V-E-L.net. And finally, to Ben Olson for recording the disclaimer that we uh, play at the very beginning of the episode. All right, final thoughts, Brad, go. I still have to watch the Prometheus, or not the Prometheus, the uh, Alien Covenant uh, in its entirety. So I feel bad that I haven't watched it in its entirety yet. Oh, the video. Yeah, the video. Okay. We'll get on it. It's only uh, five minutes or no, no, seven minutes, maybe seven. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't take too long. I just have to stop being lazy and actually watch it. So. Don't feel bad. You don't, have do. to, you don't have to do anything in the world, Brad. Don't feel pressured to do anything. If the cool kids are doing it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it as well. It kind of does. <laughs> well, Okay. <laughs> Before uh, we get to Anessa's final thought, I want your reaction, Nightwing movie. I, as a huge comic book nerd, would be very interested in watching that. Uh, I'm not sure how much of a commercial success it will be. It'll be interesting to see how they how they how they work that. So, well, it's directed. It's going to be directed by the guy that did Lego Batman, and that looks pretty good. So. Uh... I'm hopeful. I, you know, I am as well. Uh, Nightwing's an interesting character, and uh, he's not like Batman light. There's a whole different sort of thing going on there. So, and that must mean the the Robin that was in Batman versus Superman: Dawn of Justice that must have been. Oh, um, 
Oh, who's the guy, the one that died by Joker's hands? Um, Jason, Jason Todd? Todd. Yep. Okay. We'll see. All right. Uh, Anessa, what's your final thought? I don't remember. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Had it all lined up and then it was gone. Oh, right. So you know that saying where, like, if your friends jumped off of a bridge, like, would you do it? Kind of a, if everyone else is doing this, would you do it type of thing? I actually yes. met someone the other day that <laughs> jumped off of a bridge because their friends did it. Oh. Was so, it a high bridge? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know how tall the bridge was, but... They were talking about summer activities or something that they had done. And people will randomly tell me different things about their lives. And I only ever see them once or twice. And that was one of the things that I was told. <laughs> was that they were <laughs> a friend that jumped off of a bridge and they followed. I'm like, well, that answers that question. Yeah, you're, you're the guy. You're the person. <laughs> You're the guy who the saying is based off of. So. All right. Thanks, Anessa. Thanks, Brad. And thank you for listening slash watching. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next time. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. All right. Stand by. Let me shut shut it down. Shut down the video. Thanks for watching. Growly Bear, Ashley, Joanna, and Mike. And who was the other guy? Derek earlier thanks for tuning in and thanks for all the future people watching the video and uh i'm now turning it off goodbye hang on end broadcast there we go end live